Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Yes, We're Here, and we certainly are. And today, it's Michael Kay and John Flaherty, my partner on the uh, television side and also, obviously, a friend. John, how are you holding up to all this? You know what, Michael, everything here is good, and uh, usually we start our conversations when we see each other, and that is a gorgeous shirt you have right now going on. Thank you. So Thank I just want to compliment you on that, that you're not mailing it in. You're still presenting yourself like a gentleman, and it really comes across. I'll tell you what, I mailed it in last week, John. You but did? I, 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 can't, I can't do this for months, so I, I can't be a pig. Although I'm no, not that's, wearing pants. That's not you. You're not a pig. You're a gentleman. You carry yourself that way. And I look forward to getting back in the booth with you and being able to compliment your suits. Uh, some things I like, as you know, some things I don't. So uh, I'm looking forward to those days. Well, you know, I like to change it up. I see what you did. Right? I saw that. You got, you, got to, you got to finish a little bit with the change up. Oh, you want finish. to pronate, as I like to say? There we go. There we go. Now, obviously, we've known that this was going to be opening day, and we knew that it was postponed or whatever moves it moved in, in, into the future but for some reason john today it's hit me because you know we should be in the booth right now um me and david and kenny and you'd be involved in the, in the studio side does it is it hitting you more today than it has in the past absolutely and uh you know i think i get drawn back to my old playing days where opening day was the beginning right it was fresh uh, your teams can have a great year you personally are going to have a great year but I think also for us, we enjoy that, the grind of, you know, being there every day and, and prepping for the games and all of that. So uh, it's definitely hit me today, but it's also brought me back to some uh, really positive memories of some great opening days. So uh, there, it's kind of a mixed emotion day for me. Give me your best opening day. Well, there's no doubt my best opening day was my first day in the big leagues, which was 1992. And uh you know, people would say, well, you knew you made the team, so it's opening day. But I didn't know I made the team. I was actually the last player cut uh, by the Boston Red Sox in 1992. And I drove an 84 Chevy Cavalier mini wagon with wood paneling down on the side from Florida. Yep. Winter. Yeah, 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 and that's me, right? I mean, I, I was able to pull that off. And I drove that mini wagon from Winter Haven, Florida, back to Rockland County to watch my younger brother Keith play a high school baseball game. Uh, I was going to go to Pawtucket, Rhode Island the next day, AAA for the Red Sox, and find an apartment. Well, I went out that night with a few of my buddies, had a, a few too many sodas, and overslept the next day. And luckily for me, I did, because I got a call from Lou Gorman, the general manager of the Red Sox, asking, how far do you live from Yankee Stadium? And I said, uh, about 35 minutes. And he said, you need to get in the car and go to Yankee Stadium. It's opening day, Yankees, Red Sox. John Marzano has arm trouble, and you're going to be activated on the roster today. So wow. I literally had a hug with my father, jumped in the shower, uh, got, on the, got on the road, and I was sitting on the Major Deegan. I remember the old, beautiful stadium, and it's bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. I mean, it's probably about 1230 at this point because there was so much traffic. And I had to get out of my car to one of New York City police officers who's directing traffic. And I said, you're not going to believe this, but I just got called up for the Red Sox. And he looks at my car, right, a, sh a mini wagon with wood paneling. Uh, and I had to go into the back. I take out my catching bag. I show him that I'm part of the team. And he stops traffic. You remember when you come out of that parking lot and you go up to the yeah. right to the Deegan? He stopped traffic on that road. And I was kind of going down and made a left into the parking lot. And got out of the car, took a baseball, threw it up to the guy on the Deegan, and went into Yankee Stadium in the visiting clubhouse. They were ironing my last name on the back of my jersey because oh, it was such wow. a, a last-minute thing. The general manager, Lou Gorman, hands me a contract. Says, Trust me, this is you know legit. He said, you got to get out there. They're, they're announcing the team. It's now a quarter to one. Oh, I, put on, I put on a uniform. I literally walk out, I get to the visiting dugout at Yankee Stadium, they announce Frank Viola, and then Bob Shepard, the voice of the Yankees, voice from God, introduces number 15, John Flaherty. And I'm standing on the third baseline looking up in front of 56,000 on opening day, 
saying, I was just in my bed in Rockland County like two and a half hours ago, a little hungover, and now I'm standing as a big leaguer at the stadium that I used to go watch games at. Uh, I don't know if you can top that opening day. Uh, I got to tell you, John, you tell me that story. I've never heard that story before from you. And I have goosebumps. I can't imagine what you were feeling on that, on that third baseline. I mean, were your legs like jelly? It was, I was more nervous sitting on the Deegan and not being able to get into the stadium. You know, that feeling like I, I can't get there. You know, it's so excited, but also nervous and, and anxious that I couldn't get in there. So once I got into the clubhouse, and there were, I mean, there were people, there really was no players in there because they were all out in the dugout waiting to be introduced. So it was like a rush to get a uniform on me. Uh, Joe Cochran, who was uh, the great home clubhouse guy, our visiting clubhouse guy then for, uh, oh, he's home for the Red Sox. He's like, Flash, we'll take care of everything. Just get down there. You can't miss being introduced on your first day, opening day. And they rushed me down there, and I'm just – it was like one of those moments where you're, you're saying, this is not happening to me. This isn't happening to me. Did your family – did any of your family have a chance to go to the game because it was such late notice? They were able to go to the game, but they couldn't make the introductions, obviously, because of how, how last minute it was. But um, now the Red Sox were great. I walk in, how many tickets do you need? I'm like, leave, like, you know, six for my dad and my sister got out of work uh, – She's a teacher in Scarsdale at the middle school, and she rushed down to the stadium, and they were able to watch. And the interesting part of that game is, you know, Yankees, Red Sox, we all know how big those games are. But Tony Pena was in scoring position in a tied game. I was late in the game, so they should have pinch ran for him. And Butch Hobson was the manager after the game. He said, there's no way I could have done that to that kid. He didn't even have a chance to, to take a swing or throw a baseball or do anything. Uh, so I had to wait for my major league debut about 10 days, I think it was, before I finally got in the game. So you sat for 10 days on the, on the team and didn't get in? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was kind of – and, you know, listen, I was the happiest guy in the country, right? I'm a backup catcher to Tony Pena and uh, living out a dream. I thought it would last a couple of weeks until Marzano came back. I thought that they'd maybe make a trade, and I was able to hang in there, I think, all the way until August and then got called back up in September. Now, baseball players, John, are, are such incredible creatures of habit. You know, this is what I do at this time. This is what I do on this yeah. day. All the days are planned out. What do you think guys are feeling now? Because all 30 teams are going to open today. This was baseball's opening day. What do you think they're feeling? Uh, they're probably the realities hitting them, obviously. But, you know, I was part of a, an abbreviated spring training in 95 with that work stoppage and, and – the whole, the union was just telling players, stay ready, get ready, get ready, stay ready, because when that phone call comes, you're going to have to get to your spring training site in a couple of days, and, and we're going to get going right away. Um, so I imagine, you know, the Yankee players today are probably doing that same thing. How can I get my swings in? How can I get my running in? How can I get my throwing in to keep my arm strength? And obviously the pitchers are the one who are, who's are going to come back a little bit. Um, but I'm sure they're just trying to, you know, their off-season workouts are probably happening right now is what I would say. Did you see the video of Garrett Cole throwing to his wife? His, his wife was, looks like she can – I mean, She's a woman she's five months pregnant, too. Yeah, she was slinging it around pretty good, too. There was some good arm action, right? I mean, you and I always joke about, you know, getting in that position. Yeah, right there. And she had it going on. So I was, I was very impressed with that. That was amazing. It was amazing to me. Now, I had um, ESPN's Jeff Passan on my show yesterday. So, I mean, we're all hoping that there's going to be baseball this year. There's no guarantees of anything in life as we're learning, uh, but they're going to try to play. And the players have actually agreed, John, uh, according to Passan, that they would be willing to give up a lot of off days and play as much as two or as many as two doubleheaders a week to get as close to 162 as they can. I don't know how you can do it, John. I mean, players today don't play every single day, and now you're going to have two doubleheaders a week? How does that work? Would you be able to do that? And when you played, people were expected to play every day. Yeah, it's a different mindset, a different time, obviously. But was there any talk of shortening the games to seven innings on those doubleheaders? Still up in the air. Maybe one of the doubleheaders would be nine innings. The other one would be seven innings, and another doubleheader would be two seven innings. Again, it's all, it's all very fluid. Yeah, and, you know, what I remember in 95, it was an expanded roster, I think, right? We had, you know, maybe 
like three more players or something like that. So I'm sure that's all out on the table. But the players in the union, I can tell you, are chomping at the bit to get back out on the field. And obviously they don't want any injuries, but they want to be able to put a representative season out there. I, what does that number look like to you, Michael? Is it 100 games? Is it 120? I mean, you do the best you can, right? And, and try not to get people hurt. But I, I think there's probably a lot of give and take on both sides. And, and money plays into it as well. I mean, we, it is a capitalistic society, and the owners want to make money, and the players want to make as much money. But when I spoke to Mariano Rivera earlier in the week, he said a 60-game season is not representative of a champion. And then I brought up to David Cohn, uh, I believe on Tuesday, and he said, you know what? If we can only play 40 games, you have to do it for the country. You have to do it for the people. It will unite people. And if it's 40 games, then it's 40 games. And that's the way it has to be. Yeah, I, I agree with Coney all the way on that one. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Bob Lorenz how things are going to look so much different because instead of that 162-game marathon and the grind, it's going to be a sprint, right? I mean, it's going to be we have 60, 80 games, and we got to go get them right away. And those first 20 or 30 where you're trying to build up your pitchers to go deep into games are going to be huge because you're, the depth of your organization is going to be tested. But again, the, I think the players realize, I don't think, I know they do, how important it is to get back out on the field because we're all chomping at the bit for some sort of uh, distraction from what we're dealing with. So uh, they take that responsibility very seriously, uh, and I'm sure they just can't wait to get going. How would you feel, John, if they had to play at least the beginning in front of empty seats? Well, you, it's not, you know, I'm going to sound like Joe Girardi. It's not what you want, right? I mean, and obviously, um, that I think that that's probably more of a reality, I would think, than not. Um, and then maybe eventually getting the crowds back at a, at a safe pace for everybody. But the, the games themselves are the most important thing for the distraction for people at home. So I, I think Major League Baseball would try to do something as soon as possible, but be as safe as possible at the same time. How good do you think this team was going to be? Well, you know, the, the injuries and the way they overcame them last year was pretty incredible. And then you go down to Tampa and you start seeing the same old story with, you know, Aaron Judge and Stanton and Paxton getting a late start. Um, if, listen, if they're healthy, I don't think that there's anybody that can compete with them. Uh, but with all of that being said, the one thing you know as a player is that it doesn't matter what your roster looks like on paper. The expectations are there, and you have to go out and do it. And, and especially uh, in the American League East, you know, the Red Sox probably going to be down, but I think the Yankees knew, and they always know that you're, you know, you're going to get your best from everybody else. So it would have been a nice challenge. You know, I, I'm wondering, um, you see what happened with Noah Syndergaard, and I wanted to ask you this. I was going to even call you up and ask you off the air, but – you know, the Mets one time had five pitchers that they said that was going to be the future of the organization. Every single one of those guys has either had Tommy John surgery and Syndergaard's having it today. Can you, can you afford, if you're a team owner or a GM, to build a team around pitching? Pitching just doesn't last, John. Well, uh, it's obviously pitching is the biggest difference maker, you know, day in and day out. And uh, as a catcher, I appreciated that more than anybody else. Um, I think maybe you can't plan on these are these the guys we're going to have long term and make a run at it. It's got to be more of a situation where you're going eight, nine, ten deep and maybe taking the burden off of some of the guys at the top end of the rotation. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, you know, guys throw so much faster than they than, than they did when I played. I remember standing on deck, you know, back in the, the late 90s. And if a guy threw 92, 93 miles an hour, it got your attention like, OK, I got to get ready for this guy, but I don't know if the human arm is meant to throw 98, 100, and, you know, for as many innings as these guys can go. Doesn't it make you, I mean, not that you need this to appreciate them, but appreciate guys like Verlander and Scherzer and back in the day, Nolan Ryan, to throw as hard as they do. I mean, they've got to be freaks because most pitchers just can't hold up. Yeah, I think I, I look at their overall fitness and conditioning, and, you know, that's the one part of the game that is really – developed for these guys. I mean, the off-season programs weren't around when I was playing. So their their entire bodies are machines to go out there and throw 100 pitches at, at high velocity. Uh, Justin Verlander, to me, is is a freak. I, I thought this guy was going to be done years ago. Uh, he just keeps reinventing himself. He keeps getting better. And 
it does give you a greater appreciation for the longevity that some of these pitchers have been able to, to throw. Uh, you know, one of our colleagues, David Cohn, I mean, the guy threw so many pitches every time he went out there and he did it for a long time, had some bumps along the road, but it, it's incredible what some of those old timers and, and some of the modern guys can do. All right, John. So full disclosure, we're, we're taping this early in the afternoon uh, on Thursday. And I, I'd say that I probably washed my hands 12 times already today. I mean, just walking from one room to the next and everybody in the house, isn't leaving the house. It's just, I think it's a good habit to get into. And you sing happy birthday twice. And you, you know, you scratch this. And scratch, I mean, a lot of soap. It's changed my life. I, I think I'm going to do this moving forward. I was never a big hand washer. No, I don't think it's going to change for, for us moving forward, right? Everything is different. And I have thought a lot about you because I, in the situation, I'm very lucky that I have older kids, right? Uh, two in college and a senior in high school. Uh, two out of the three are boys, and to be honest with you, they, they don't really need a whole lot of attention. They do their thing and they move around, but you with some young children in the house, I have a whole different appreciation for what you guys must be going through, trying to keep the kids entertained and keep your sanity at the same time. I think the entertainment's going well. The sanity is probably not, and uh, it's wearing Jody out because she's homeschooling two of them and doing a a full curriculum. It's un it's unbelievable. Wow. Wow. I make sure hey, teachers, I, I mean, we, we shouldn't have to have times like this to appreciate, you know, the, the first responders, nurses, doctors, post office workers, FedEx, UPS. It's amazing what these people do and teachers to, to keep our society running. And you don't really appreciate it until maybe it's taken away. Yeah. It's going to be a whole new appreciation of all the, uh, the hospital workers, right, and what they're putting themselves out there. And, and you know, I, I constantly look for positives in, in bad situations, and I also look for leadership in, in tough situations. And, you know, to hear that 40 or 60,000 people in New York have come out of retirement to get back to the hospitals. Um, my girlfriend is, a, is a, a therapist and has signed up for that, too, 6,000 mental health experts are you know volunteering their time and their services to help out so things like that in bad times kind of make you realize i think the human spirit and most importantly uh that of new yorkers and people on the east coast uh pretty resilient and special people well john you and yours please stay safe and everybody watching us as well uh we're going to be back at some point but right now yes we are in fact here